Just as the Persians were building their empire in Asia, another people far away on the shores of the Aegean were toying with a new and novel idea, that the people, the Demos, might wield power or Kratos, and thus democracy was born. Our story starts in the 6th century, and it doesn't start on a good note. At this time, Athens was a city in the midst of a crisis. Economic inequality was rising, the peasant farmers were slowly being drowned in debt, with some even entering slavery, and aristocratic rivalries threatened stability. This, in a Greek society especially, threatened ruin. As with the rest of Greece, the bread and butter of the army was the hoplite. He was protected by mighty bronze armour, but the real strength of a phalanx lay in its unity. Only if each man kept his cool, and each soldier trusted those next to him and those who led them, could a Greek army hope to survive. But why should an impoverished farmer soldier stay and fight for some blood-sucking noble? And how was an impoverished farmer soldier supposed to pay for equipment at all? A military crisis loomed. Reform was needed. And it was needed fast. As if to prove this point, the Athenians were currently being humiliated in a war for the island of Salamis by Megara, a puny city on the Isthmus of Corinth. Desperate to stave off the tides of decline that now lapped at their feet, the Athenians began casting around for someone to save them. The man they chose was Solon. He was famed as one of the seven sages of Greece, and the wisest man in Athens to boot. As such, Solon was uniquely placed to diagnose and cure the diseases that had racked the city for so long. Solon made sure to curry the favour of both the aristocracy and the poor, and he was given total power over Athens for the year of 594 BC, with the purview to do anything necessary to fix the city. Solon realised that social harmony could not be restored without reducing the plight of the common man. As he would later boast, I used my strong shield to protect both sides of the class divide, allowing neither to gain an advantage over the other that would be unjust. To this end, he began hacking away at the rot in the Athenian state. Firstly, he cancelled all debts in Attica, and ordered that every freeborn Athenian who had been enslaved by credit sharks must be freed. This also meant that property was returned to the average farmer, giving a new lease of life to the impoverished farmer class. Solon refused to buckle to the outrage, and instead solemnly proclaimed the dire need for his reforms. Secondly, the city's ruling aristocracy would be modified slightly, not to democracy, but to an assembly of sorts. The city's aristocrats now had to be voted in by the citizens, although the poorer citizens were not allowed to speak in this assembly. He undertook several other reforms, but in the interests of time we won't be discussing them here. After his stint as Athens as Archon in 594, Solon departed the city for a Mediterranean cruise. He had done much to reduce inequality, but as he left Athens it was a city that was still in many ways unchanged. Sure, the poor had been freed, the abuses of the rich curtailed, and more legal recourse given to the poor, but the rich still monopolised most political power, a state of affairs that would not last forever. The 6th century rumbled on, and Athens was on the road to recovery. After a renewed bout of conflict, Salamis was wrested from the Megarans. However, aristocratic rivalries continued to swirl. By the 560s, the Athenian family that would cause the most trouble were the Alcmaeonids, primarily because the Alcmaeonids were a family in exile, accursed and spurned by their fellow citizens. Back in 630, a strongman tried to seize control of Athens, but the Archon at the time, Megacles, soon trapped him in a temple, where he was offered safe conduct, which he eagerly accepted, but the second they stepped out, he had them killed. A job well done, Megacles might have thought, but others disagreed. In Athens, rival families snarled and snapped at each other, constantly sniffing for advantages. This feuding resulted in Megacles' family, the Alcmaeonids, being exiled in 600 BC. Promises were sacred things, and several of the Alcmaeonids enemies were able to gang up on them using this pretext to force them out of the city. The stain of scandal had followed the Alcmaeonids ever since, but now, four decades on, they plotted their return, and they wouldn't have to wait much longer. By the 560s, there were several prominent figures on the Athenian stage. First, there was Lycurgus, perhaps the grandest aristocrat in Athens, and the head of the Boutad family. Then there was Pasistratus, a dashing, young and well-connected war hero. In the aftermath of the Salamis campaigns, he had been one of Athens' high flyers, and it was his ambition to go higher still. He always made sure to court the love of the people, and was soon the most powerful man in the city. One day, Pacistratus faked an assassination attempt upon himself, and then rushed to the assembly, 
asking for a group of bodyguards to protect him from his enemies. Many protested at this request, including Solon himself, who warned of a tyranny, but they were breezily ignored. Pacis Stratus' request was granted. He had his bodyguards. He then promptly occupied the Acropolis, the mighty citadel that dominated the Athenian skyline. Even now, two and a half thousand years later, Solon can still be heard face palming down the ages. The Athenians suddenly woke to find their city in the grasp of a tyrant. This might seem like a point that's been done to death already, but in ancient Greece the word tyrant did not have the same connotations it does today. For them, being a tyrant did not mean that you were cruel or despotic, merely that your rule was technically illegal. The other aristocrats of Athens did not have the strength to oppose Pesistratus alone, whose connections and popular touch gave him wide-ranging support. It was at this moment that the Alcmaeonids smugly made their return. With Pesistratus looming over them, Lycurgus and the Butad family were in no mood to be picky about their allies. A pact of friendship was sealed between the two former rivals, and their combined power soon forced Pesistratus to scamper into exile. He was down but not out, and was confident that this exile would only be a temporary one. His confidence sprang from the fact that the Alcmaeonids were arrogant, haughty and overbearing. The Butads were also arrogant, haughty and overbearing. The alliance of the two families could only last for so long. All Pesistratus need do was wait, and the cracks would soon show. His patience would be rewarded a few years later, when the Alcmaeonids, eager to do away with the Butads, began cobbling together a remarkable scheme with Pesistratus. To cement this unexpected alliance, Pesistratus divorced his wife and married into the Alcmaeonid clan, and they prepared to put their plan into action. On paper, the scheme that these veteran politicians devised was so ridiculous that if it wasn't real, you'd assume I'm making it up. Pesistratus found an incredibly tall and handsome woman, who he then had suited and booted until she looked like the goddess Athena herself. The two of them then hopped on a decked out chariot and sped off down the road to Athens. You could be forgiven for thinking that this would end in disaster, but against all the odds, this bit of theatre stunned the crowds, who were apparently gobsmacked by the appearance of a patron deity on their very streets. With the support of the Alcmaeonids as well, Pesistratus was able to swoop back onto the Acropolis. Unfortunately for him, it wasn't long before the Alcmaeonids started backstabbing him again. They began circulating malicious rumours that Pesistratus was unwilling to consummate his marriage with his new Alcmaeonid wife. This allowed the Alcmaeonids to play the part of the morally outraged in-laws, and they once again allied with the Butads to drive out Pesistratus. All this double-crossing had essentially brought them back to square one, but it was now clear that the Alcmaeonids were the preeminent clan in Athens. Pesistratus fled once again to lick his wounds, and he spent the next decade patching together a power base, awkwardly dropping his Alcmaeonid wife and returning to his first spouse. He then gained the support of backers in Thebes, and finally, in 546 BC, he made his move. Landing at the beaches near Marathon, he struck out for Athens, ready to smash the treacherous Alcmaeonids once and for all. The Alcmaeonids were also spoiling for a fight, but discipline was lax. Pesistratus surprised the Alcmaeonid army while they were waiting in the town of Palene, and he soon won a decisive victory. The road to Athens lay open. Victory was his at last. Third time's the charm, as they say. The Alcmaeonids did not bother returning to Athens. Instead, they fled directly into exile, and Pesistratus became tyrant unopposed. Thankfully, the new tyrant proved to be merciful and even-handed, with Pesistratus easing aristocratic opposition by doling out a few magistracies or commands to certain figures. At the same time, he sent the children of opponents to the island of Naxos as hostages, and introduced exotic Scythian soldiers to police the streets. The poor weren't ignored either, and he did his best to ease the plight of the farmers with grants of cash. Cash which was raised through progressive taxes on the rich, making this one of the earliest wealth redistribution schemes, while he made sure to constantly get his face out there and brand himself as a man of the people. As a result, his reign would prove to be a time of great peace and prosperity for Athens, and furthermore, his reign would be transformative in a more subtle way. The influence of the aristocracy was by and large replaced by the influence of the tyrant, so when the tyrants were finally toppled, the aristocrats were not well placed to halt the tide of democracy. In Athens itself, grand new temples and plazas rose from the ground, increasing employment and improving his prestige, while abroad Pesistratus sponsored the conquest of the Thracian Chersonese, giving the growing Athenian population a fresh source of cheap grain. 
When Pasistratus died in 527 BC, after 19 years in power, he was peacefully succeeded by his two sons, Hipparchus and Hippias. It seemed that the Pasistratid tyranny was here to stay. And for the first few years of the brothers' rule, all was well. New projects continued to beautify the Athenian skyline, and the population remained docile. In the end, it would take a lover's quarrel to mark the beginning of the end for the tyrants. It revolved around the lovers Harmodion and Aristogeiton. Harmodion was supposedly the most beautiful man in Athens, and Hipparchus tried to get him between the lovers, only to end up angering them both. Events finally came to a head when the angered lovers tailed Hipparchus, waited for a moment when his bodyguards were distracted, and then struck at once. Hipparchus was felled by a hail of knife blows. His bodyguards then returned the favour to Harmodion, while Aristogeiton was captured. The miserable Aristogeiton was tortured for days, but it eventually became clear that this event was not the result of any great conspiracy, and he was executed. Hippias was greatly shaken by his brother's assassination, and he grew paranoid and despotic. Executions and tortures became common, and the people began to look for a way out. Their saviour materialised in the form of Cleisthenes, an Alcmaeonid. He had benefited from the Pasistratid's even-handedness in the aftermath of their triumph, and had even served as an archon under Hippias and Hipparchus, but he had soon overplayed his hand and been forced into exile. Like all exiled Alcmaeonids, he was soon planning his return, and he launched an invasion of Attica. Unfortunately, Cleisthenes found his support among the people to be lacking. Sure, they wanted change, but what good would it do to exchange one form of oppression for another? The appetite for real change was beginning to appear, although no one could quite work out what that change could be. Hippias, for his part, was having none of it, and quickly swatted Cleisthenes away like a fly. Cleisthenes fled once more into exile, but he kept his eyes on the prize. He would be back very soon, and when he returned it would be in force, for he was fleeing to Sparta. One of the current kings of Sparta, an ambitious schemer by the name of Cleomenes, had been following the events in Attica for a while now. The Pasistratids were technically friends of Sparta, so when Cleisthenes rocked up and begged for his help, Cleomenes was apprehensive. Then again, he undoubtedly found the idea of putting Athens under the Spartan yoke appealing. Nevertheless, the Spartans were a fervently religious people, and the concept of breaking their treaty of friendship was too far. Cleisthenes, however, was one step ahead of them. The Alcmaenids, you see, had gotten into a friendly relationship with the priests of Apollo at Delphi ever since their first period of exile, nearly a century ago, and Cleisthenes was now ready to call in old favours. When the Spartans asked the oracle at Delphi for guidance, all they got back was the same response, that it was their duty to set Athens free. This, to the Spartans, was certainly beguiling, but the word of a god could not be easily ignored. Even so, the Spartans' discomfort at attacking a friend of Sparta was apparent in the fact that they only sent a tiny task force in 511. This was defeated, so in 510 Cleomenes led a far larger invasion of Attica. The superior Spartan training soon proved its worth. Hippias was blockaded on the Acropolis, his family were captured in an escape attempt, and he capitulated. And just like that, the tyranny was over. But Cleomenes allowed Hippias and his family to flee into exile. The tyranny was over, but almost immediately the victors began to argue over what it should be replaced with. Cleisthenes wished for a free Athens. Cleomenes wanted a subservient one. Something had to give, and it had to give soon. King Cleomenes withdrew from Athens, and began supporting Cleisthenes' political opponents, in the hopes that, if he could not outright conquer the city, he could at least make sure it was riven by factionalism. In 508 BC, one of Cleisthenes' greatest enemies in Athens, and a friend of Cleomenes by the name of Isagoras, was elected to the Archonship. With Sparta turned against him and the aristocracy opposed to him, Cleisthenes turned to a radical course of action. As previously stated, power and authority had become shadowy under the Pasistratids. The tyrants had broken the bonds between the aristocrats and power, so in the wake of their fall, questions of legitimacy abounded. If Cleisthenes wanted to knock Isagoras down a peg and reinforce his own position, he would need some radical action, and there was no time like the present. And so, at the assembly, with Isagoras listening in and Cleomenes no doubt keeping a beady eye on things from Sparta, Cleisthenes revealed his gambit. In the words of Herodotus, he set himself up as a special friend of the people. Or in other words, he offered power, Kratos, to the people, the demos. They had a word for this, 
Democratia, democracy. A bold gamble it may have been, but Cleisthenes knew full well what he was doing when he rolled these particular dice. The spark spread like wildfire, and his support swelled. Isagoras, on the other hand, was caught thoroughly flat-footed and was unable to counter his rival's moves. With no other choice, Isagoras turned to the king of Sparta. Cleomenes, for his part, was annoyed at this reversal, but he wasn't unduly alarmed, for he had not yet fully understood the revolution that had overtaken Athens. The Spartan led some troops across the Isthmus of Corinth and rapidly descended upon Athens. It was at this critical moment that Cleisthenes lost heart, and in the spirit of a true Alcmaenid, fled into exile. The Spartans then reoccupied the Acropolis. Cleomenes and Isagoras began talks to lay out the constitutional order. But as the discussions continued, they were interrupted by a great commotion coming from down below. The two men heard the thundering of footsteps and the rumbling of angry voices. Dread filled their hearts, for those were the sounds of a riot. And when the king gazed down from the Acropolis, he saw the citizens of Athens staring angrily back up at him. Now that they had their freedoms, they would not give them up so easily. Furthermore, Isagoras had been very heavy-handed when dealing with opposition, exiling Cleisthenes' Alcmaenids, as well as many other families. They blockaded him for three days, after which the Spartans were allowed to flee back home with their tails between their legs. Isagoras' supporters would not be so lucky. Isagoras himself fled for exile, but his supporters were soon put to death. The Spartans would return, and next time they would leave nothing to chance. For now though, democracy had survived its baptism of fire, and it was now time to find out what Athenian democracy truly meant. One of Cleisthenes' relatives was elected Archon, and he made his return. Cleisthenes started laying out exactly what he had in mind. Political participation was extended to every man, and any man, no matter how poor, could now speak in the assembly and debate the important issues of the day. The old aristocratic institutions, meanwhile, were stripped of their power. Freedom of speech was guaranteed, freedoms which were most clearly exercised in the assembly, where no measure relating to city policy could be taken without a vote from the assembled uh, assembly. Now, Athenian democracy was far from perfect. Only the rich could run for office, while women and slaves were not given the vote. Some citizens still remained more equal than others. All three citizens across Attica were partitioned into ten new tribes, which were made up of three so-called tritiyes, a Greek word that means thirds, since each third was picked from a different corner of Attica. In this way, Cleisthenes broke the bonds of loyalty between people and their local aristocrat, and replaced them with the bonds of loyalty with the tribes and the tritiyes, which were very hard for an ambitious aristocrat to exploit, since they represented the full range of Athenian society, both geographically and socially. Below the tritiyes were the deems, which constituted small parishes and towns. As a final defence against any overambitious politician, Cleisthenes likely introduced something called ostracism. In short, it meant that once a year the Athenians could vote to exile one citizen for a period of ten years. Their property would be maintained while they were gone, but this, democracy's death laser, could kill careers outright. However, Cleisthenes' reforms wouldn't count for anything if democracy was killed in the crib. The Spartans were returning, and this time they weren't messing around. Both Spartan kings, Cleomenes and Demaratus, began the march with a huge host composed of troops from all across the Peloponnese. The Athenians assembled a force of their own and prepared to confront the invaders. But as they marched, shocking news reached the ears of the Athenians. The men of Corinth refused to march any further, leading to many other contingents to desert Cleomenes. Furthermore, Cleomenes' co-king, Demaratus, was against the war with Athens, and his influence closed the issue. Cleomenes was outraged, but he was powerless to act. He withdrew, and in the most anticlimactic turn of events, Athens was saved. Many praised the gods for this good fortune, but others cast a wary eye at Cleisthenes, and wondered whether it was in fact his skills of bribery that had secured the Corinthian desertion. Bribery or no, Athens was saved, although around the same time conflict flared up with both Thebes and Chalcis, so the Athenians swung north, crushed the Thebans in battle, before marching to the Chalcians and giving them a bloody nose, forcing them to sue for peace and accept a large Athenian colony on their land. And just like that, seemingly overnight, the city of Athens elbowed its way into the big boys club of Greece. Their newfound freedom put fire into their bellies, while Attica's regional identity put Athens at the head of a large chunk of manpower. 
manpower that was no longer being kneecapped by extreme debt and poverty. The Athenians immediately set to work constructing monuments to their newfangled democracy. But while they looked to the future, Cleisthenes was busy fabricating the past. In order to legitimise this new and revolutionary shake-up, he began spinning the tale that democracy wasn't anything new at all. Instead, according to him, it had actually been handed down to them from the earliest days of their mythology. Ironically, it's the measure of his success in this act of smoke and mirrors that Cleisthenes was never particularly honoured in Athens for essentially founding their democracy. He had spun his yarn so successfully that the Athenians easily ate up the belief that their democracy was an ancient tradition, not some recent invention. Cleisthenes had no place in his new mythology. We don't even know when he died. It was some time after 508. Athenian democracy nevertheless owes its success to Cleisthenes and his associates. From now on, the people of Athens held their own destiny in their hands, and they would need to brace themselves for a storm was coming. In 507, the Athenians had sent envoys to the Persian satrap of Sardis, asking for an alliance. The satrap responded that an alliance could be agreed upon so long as the Athenians agreed to give earth and water to Persia, or in other words, submission. The envoys didn't understand what this meant at the time and gave it. When they returned home, they were angrily lambasted for this act, but nothing else came of it. The Athenians hoped that this would be the last of their dealings with the Persians, but as we shall see, things were just getting started. The Athenian assembly would come to debate many important things over the course of its history, but in 499 BC it held its perhaps most important debate yet. In that year, all of Greece reverberated with cataclysmic news. The Greek cities of Ionia had risen in revolt against their Persian masters, the empire was in chaos, and the king of kings, no doubt, was furious. Soon enough, the leader of the Ionians arrived in Athens, and he arrived with a simple request. He asked that the Athenians help them in their revolt against the great king. It was brought before the assembly, and in this, one of history's most world-changing debates, the assembled Athenians weighed up the pros and cons of going to war with the most powerful man on earth. Their answer, when it finally came, would bring great change to the world, and fire and blood to the shores of Greece. Greece.